Niggas don't know. Niggas don't know. This time, 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 this
fiddling with like tiny little cams right. and like totally. I do like stuff like that, but it's been nice. It's like, oh, this tipped out number six, no big deal. Like, yep. It'll hold me regardless. Yeah, it's interesting what we can convince our minds to be okay with. Yeah. You know, it's it's such an interesting sport. And off with is this weird little side shoot of the sport that's really strange. Yeah, no kidding. <clears throat> Yeah. No kidding. So I'm I'm super stoked that you're here. Yeah, and, thanks. And that you're willing to sit down and talk about this because, you know, we're going to dig into something that's, I think, is a really important topic that's not talked about enough. And I don't have a, a ton of personal experience with it, and I have even less knowledge of it. Um, so... You're going to be walking me through all of this. And and essentially, that's why I do this podcast anyway, is because I want to learn. And this is a an area I really don't know a lot about. So, and talk me through, you know, we, we are, we're all aware that, especially in the 90s, there was this, you know, there were a lot of climbers, especially female climbers, but quite a few male climbers too, who had eating disorders, mm -hmm. and and it wasn't really talked about a lot, and still really isn't. It just kind of gets swept under the rug a little bit. Occasionally, someone speaks up. Was it something that started for you through climbing, or was it earlier than that? So I started climbing about six years ago, and my eating disorder started around eight years ago. Okay. Um, I was playing soccer at the time and like growing up, I <sighs> never was really like, I, w I was overweight. I was actually like overweight growing up okay. and um, going through like grade school, you know, people are always trying to like pick on other people based off of their own insecurities. So sure, I was constantly sure. bullied and yeah, like I never, rough time, grade oh, school is. no kidding. And I like never let that really affect me until like one day at soccer practice, I worked so hard to get to this like top level, like nationally ranked team. And I like finally made it there. And it's not like, you know, I did anything drastic. I just like, you know, practice like nonstop. Right. And I like finally got there. And the first day of practice, they decided like during the middle of a little like game, they pulled my shirt up to make fun of how I looked in comparison to them. Who did? Uh, a player on the team that I was like joining for practice. Oh, man. Um, and that was like super devastating and I was very embarrassed. And that's kind of like when everything happened. So I had like built up so much like all the bullying I never like talked about and my parents didn't even knew, know until like not so long ago. Um, that's when I told them all about it. And I let that build up to a point where I like couldn't take it anymore. So I was like, you know, I feel like my life's out of kind, kind of out of control right now. So I'm going to control what I think I know how to and that's food. And so, right. that's, so that became the thing that you were able to take control of, take charge of. Yeah, absolutely. That was your thing. Absolutely. And that's like <clears throat> most of the time what eating disorders really like start from. It's like feeling like loss of control or if something traumatic happens, it's something that like you can't control. You're dealing with all these emotions that you don't know what to do with. So you go to what you know you for sure always can control, which is like food. Yeah, I guess that makes total sense. You know, I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, you know, how it starts or why it starts. I'd always just assumed because I'm a male and I'm logical by nature, I go straight to like, you know, if if someone has an eating disorder for the sake of climbing because they want to get lighter, well, just convince them that they just need to get stronger. It's not that they need to be lighter and that'll fix it. But that's not really the case. You no. Know? And it's actually kind of crazy because a lot of people do like get eating disorders like through climbing, like because they have this like mentality of like, I just need to like lose weight to send harder. And like, I've noticed that in a, like a lot of people that I've talked to or other people have come up to me and told me like about their friends. And um, it's not like some people sure can like <clears throat> do that. And I don't, I obviously don't support people like losing weight to just send something harder, but right. it there's some people that just have like the propensity to become like obsessed about it to a point where they just like can't let it go. Do you and, think it has, you think it still comes down to that control issue? Like, you know, all these things that we do to try to get better at climbing are really nebulous. They're yeah. really tough to latch onto and, and see any, 
any real measurable gain from anything. Yeah. And like you just said, food became this thing that you could control. Yeah. It's it's something that people can control and see pretty immediate, you know, within a few days results from and and you just want to control it more and more and more when you start to see those results. And that's the exact thing. Like people start seeing like, "Oh man, I'm like they'll get really they'll get strong and then to capitalize on that, they'll also lose weight." Right. Which is kind of like counterintuitive. Yep. Um, but then so when you get in this, like a lot of people, when they get in that mindset, they just continue to it's like instant gratification. You see that <clears> it's working. So you continue to like go forward. And what I like have talked to like I actually talked to Angie Payne about this mm -hmm. and we were like trying to figure out like how we got through the times where we were like eating so very little like during during the day and still being able to train and it's just like really interesting how well our bodies adapt for being so like unhealthy at the time sure but you do get to a point where your body's just like i've had enough and you like for example i shattered my wrist because your bones become really fragile a mm -hmm. lot of times when you like restrict your diet you're not getting enough nutrients or there's a lot of like almost permanent damage that we can be like created from just something that you think is so like short term just like going on a diet to send my new project you sure know? sure physically mentally emotionally oh, absolutely you know absolutely and let's let's back up just a little bit and i, I really want to understand how it manifested for you how climbing got involved in that and mm -hmm. and what those dangers were when you saw the climbing community and then where, you know, how the community has reacted to your being a little outspoken about it and being open with it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, after you were being bullied and you, you took control of food, um, you know, where did it go from there? How long did that go on before you decided you needed to do something about it? So this was when I was, that started when I was 12. Like that whole incident was when I was 12. And how were you controlling the food at that point? Was it just a I was starting less to just, food or? I was just restricting my intake, like completely. Okay. I was just getting to the point. I like went down to where I was eating only like a very few amount of calories per day, but it was like over right. time. And it first like manifested as, oh, I'm just like going on a diet to like be healthier for soccer. Like I want to get really fit kind right, of thing. Right. And like, that's what I disguise it as. And like, I was 13 and I like 12 or 13 at the time. And I like still can't believe like those things were going through my mind being so young. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> so that's kind of when it all started and it was fine at first. And like people noticed like that I was eating a little bit healthier and that like never, you know, caused them to say anything. Um, but then they also noticed that I was like losing a lot of weight. Right. And at first, like my parents didn't realize like what exactly was going on. Um, they didn't really equate like m I was also like dealing with like immense amount of like depression and sadness at the time. And, they and was that from the bullying um, or from other things? It's like really hard to tell. Like we 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 kind of think it's actually from the fact that I just like. A lot of times with eating disorders, you're you're so depriving yourself of like nutrition that right. it leads you like without carbohydrates, anyone is unhappy. Sure. And like sure. that's kind of the same thing. And so like that's something that we kind of are thinking like caused the depression kind of episode just Yeah, then. it makes sense. Yeah. And then so that kind of that's how it really spiraled downward until two days before my birthday. This was February fifteenth, two thousand ten. I was um put into a mental facility, a mental hospital for a week. And I spent a week, my, spent my birthday there. Um, I turned 14 there. Wow. Um, yeah. It's such a catch 22. It's such a, the cycle that seems impossible to break that you're, you're controlling the intake of your food because of these external factors, yeah. you know, and then 
because of lack of proper nutrition, you end up depressed and that causes you to want to control your food intake even more. Yeah, exactly. Which makes you more depressed. It's this like awful downward spiral. I always think of it that way or like a snowball, like a downward snowball effect. And it just like keeps getting worse as you keep moving further along. And so I spent like a week there and that's when they found out that I did have an eating disorder. Right, And they right. noticed that like obviously when I wasn't eating during like meal group times or I like wasn't eating like I was only eating a salad and I take like everything off of it. Right. And like it was pretty obvious that something was wrong. And mm-hmm. um, so that was when I was 14 then once I turned it in the, the hospital. And um, from that point on, I still played so I had to like gain all the weight back. I physically got better, but never emotionally accepted it um, right. and kind of lied about it, honestly, to my parents and to like my care team. I was just like, eh, yeah, whatever. It'll go away on its own. Or, you know, it's kind of comforting to know that like my eating disorder is still back there. I can use it whenever I want to. Right. Which is right. like so evil, but yeah, it's, how sure. it, it's how it was. And so I went back to playing soccer. Um, this was late 2010. And that's when I like like really broke my wrist I broke my ulna and my radius in like a few different places um in a soccer game and I was out for a while and then I came back again to for this was early 2011 and And when you were out like after you broke your ulna and your wrist that didn't cause you to go back into this no believe it or not well I like was I had still dealt with like depression i was going to therapy often i was on medication so at that point people were watching and yeah exactly exactly yeah. and so it wasn't it really didn't affect me which was kind of surprising at the time but what really got me was happened next was what happened next um march 23rd of 2011 i was playing my like one of my first like high school soccer games and i got my like third and worst concussion i've ever had mm-hmm. um and i was i went to the doctor and I went to a neurologist and I was basically told I couldn't play contact sports ever again. Right, right. And I defined my like, they life. They took something away from you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The biggest void was created in my life. I, I played soccer all of my life. That's how I defined myself. Like right. everything I did was like circling around soccer and like my end goal of playing like soccer in college. And um, so that was extremely devastating to hear that. It was, that was when... Like my eating disorder, like was like, yeah, this is the time I'm really gonna make my presence now. Right, right. And so they just took my identity away. Let me exactly. control this thing that exactly. I can control. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's when I like relapsed again, and I was doing treatment at the Atlanta Center for Eating Disorders for four months, um, doing like intensive outpatient. So like between fifteen and twenty hours of therapy a week balancing like being in high school <laughs> right um right which is kind of crazy and like even then i got physically back like back to where i needed to be i was like weight restored <clears throat> but i never emotionally or mentally decided i was ready to heal right they're they're treating the physical exactly response mm-hmm. and and they're not you know they're they're treating the the symptoms but not the cause exactly exactly and so that's kind of like that's when I started climbing, though, was during the time that I was in treatment. So, like, my climbing started out, like, one day a week. I was allowed to go and train at the local gym in Atlanta. And, well, train as in, like, learn to climb. Right, right, right. Um, and, like, get some technique. Um, and that was, like, really inspiring because it's so cliche and cheesy. Like, it's so how climbing, like, is so relatable to life. And you're, like, kind of moving up and... Like, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it was very much like needed in my life at this at this moment. Yep. Um, because I was really struggling at that time to kind of like find who I was, and mm-hmm. just like everyone else that goes to the gym for the first time, they become hooked. Well, most yep. people catch the climbing bug, right? And so that's when I like really, really started to like think of myself as like a different like name or label like I was a climber right which was right. kind you had, of cool. you had a new identity it was kind of cool and yeah. I really really liked that for once and I go to therapy and like go to the group sessions at the Atlanta Center for Eating Disorders and I'd, I'd talk about climbing I'd wear my like climbing shirts from Stone Summit and just stuff like that um I was so stoked on it yeah even though I could only climb like one day a week and um that's kind of where it took off and 
Um, so I continued to climb until I relapsed again, m- like mid 2012. What caused that relapse? Was it climbing related? Oh, at it was all? climbing related. This was definitely climbing related because, like everyone, when they first start climbing, they hit this like awesome, awesome. Like they just go really fast and get yeah. Like, you you get really good really quick. Absolutely, <laughs> and then you hit that plateau. Yep. And I hit that plateau. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I think I can do something about this. I think I know what's going to help me. And so, like, right. I went back to food. Yeah. And so I relapsed. And um, that time, though, was my decision to go to treatment. Like, one Good of the. For you. Yeah. That was like the first time that it was actually my decision. So I went to treatment and then I did a lot of like like after treatment kind of ther- group therapy that mm-hmm. I was like pretty religious about. And I like finally felt like I started to get a grip on like my eating disorder. Right. Um, and then. Were you telling friends about it at this point? Like did any oh, of your climber friends know? Absolutely not. No one knew. Right. Like maybe like one or two <clears throat> of my climber friends. But. Usually I just like try to hide my time away from climbing as being related to something else. Like I was injured or was busy with school, something related to that. I was So you making this decision to go get treatment was was literally step number one for you. Oh, absolutely. First step you had initiated. Yep. And the time that I've been dealing with like my eating disorder so far, that was the first time I decided I wanted to like take action. Right. And um so that Fast forward through high school, I was doing fine. I had my first, got my first boyfriend. I ended up graduating high school. And then come around my freshman year of college, my mom and dad moved to Chicago. um, But I was still living in Atlanta, going Mm -hmm. to school. Um, And so I was fine, like the beginning of my freshman year and everything was going great. But I noticed that like it was getting really hard for me because it was the first time I was living on my own and like away from my family. And then my my boyfriend and I broke up. Um, so like all of this stuff. Lots like, of things out of your control. Exactly. And so what did I do? Unfortunately, like I laugh about it because I just find it amusing today that I like use something so self-destructive to make myself feel like whole when in reality it was pushing me in the opposite direction. But yeah, I like relapsed and I decided, so I came up to Chicago for a Memorial Day weekend and 2015 and um that's literally on the plane ride back to atlanta i decided that i wanted to move to chicago to like restart my life completely and so that i moved a week later and that's kind of where like my latest like recovery like latest chapter in recovery i guess started And I kind of took a different approach this time. Instead of like going the traditional route of treatment, I decided to like have a care team of my own. Like I had a doctor that I had to see weekly for like blood tests and stuff. And then I had like a dietitian and a therapist and a psychiatrist and they were all like inter intertwined. And did it feel different this time because it was your choice? Yeah, it felt completely different. And it also felt different because I like moved to a different city. I moved away from like... I I restarted my life completely. Yeah. And that I th- was I think sometimes that's really important. You know, I went through something similar in a self-destructive sort of way yeah. and I had to do the exact same thing. Yeah. Totally restart my life and get rid of all of my past and and try to become someone else. Someone I wanted to be and not what I was becoming. Yeah, exactly. You know? And that's kind of what it was for me. <clears throat> and so like just opening myself um up to a completely different community yeah um and then like immersing myself in a new gym trying new things being in the big city compared to being like in like a suburb of atlanta there's so much like going on for me in chicago that i really felt was going to be beneficial for me in the long run and that's when i felt like it was appropriate for me and the time that i had been dealing with my eating disorder to start a blog to talk about it all Right. And um, what's the blog address? Uh, it's savannabuick.com. So yeah. um, it's just, yeah, my first name and last name, which is great. Yeah. And I, I remember you reached out to me when you first started it and, you know, said that you had been reading my blog and you appreciated it and wanted me to read yours. And 
And honestly, I get quite a few people who say, I want to write a blog. This is what I've got. And and if, when I first got the message, I was like, probably just another one of those. <laughs> and then I read it and I was like, wow, this is really brave. It's it's raw and it's brave it because hard. there's not a lot of people talking about it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, there there's not a lot of people talking about it, especially like within sports and the climbing yeah. community. Yep. And I felt like this was my time to really like have a voice and have a say about like what I was going through because I felt like I could be the voice for a lot of other people who weren't ready to talk yet. Because I felt like in a strong enough place to finally feel like I had that voice. And so that's when I like opened up about my like whole struggle that I'd been dealing with since like seventh grade. And it's as much as like I've wanted to update it often, mm. I've updated as often as I can, but it's sure. kind of just been like my my path of recovery. It's not to recovery, it's of right. recovery. Recovery is such a lifestyle and it's such a lifelong journey. And that's like what I try to like articulate within my like blog post is what recovery actually looks like, what eating disorders actually look like and what they aren't and stuff like that. So Yeah, and I think... You know, I think something important that you're doing is that your blog at this point needs to be something for you to use as a recovery tool. And you need to be able to work your way through it and figure yourself out really well before you can help people. Yeah. You know? and, and, it's, and it's started to catch on. Like I see people sharing it and I see that there are conversations happening and so I know that's the direction it's going which I which is really exciting to me so exciting <laughs> how since since you moved to Chicago and you started taking steps to you know make these changes yourself have you relapsed since then Nope, I haven't. And I think that a lot of it does have to do with my f the fact that I've been so open about it. It's like everyone kind of serves as like an accountability for me. Yeah, you've got a lot of people now exactly. to answer to. Exactly. And so it's been it's been really, really nice to kind of have such a like, I feel like I just have a really strong backbone. I have a really strong community that like stands behind me and like is there for me when I need it. But I also have so many people that look up to me too that have like right. sent me emails saying like I'm really inspired by your story but at the same time I like have to show myself some like compassion and let myself know that it is okay to kind of like slip up every now and then because recovery is totally not perfect right for um, sure um, and that goes with like anything I think like eating disorders have a lot I've been to like a couple like AA meetings and eating disorders have a lot to do with like there's very similar to alcoholic like being an alcoholic or being a drug addict from from people that I've like talked to, it's all about this like addiction to something. Right. Um, and it kind of, it's kind of the same thing. And so. like you said, this is what I can control. Like this is the yeah. thing in my life that no matter what sort of chaos is going on around me, whether it's my family or I'm being bullied or I can't send any of my projects or whatever that chaos is for you, that's something you can grab a hold of and be in 100% control of. Yeah. And and even though it might look to to the people outside looking in that you're out of control, you still feel like you're totally in control of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And that feeling is addicting in itself. Uh-huh. Totally. It's been it's been a little it's just been a little crazy with like having a blog and knowing that I do have so many people that like look up to me, it almost gets to be like sometimes superficial and I never like try to let it get that way. Mm, right. Um, right, right. but it's been, like I said before, it's been probably the most helpful thing I've ever done like for recovery so far, like compared to any treatment I've gone through. Um, just being so open about it has been just extremely helpful for me. Now, do you think that sort of, addiction so to speak to something you can control has carried over to other things that you've had to be careful with or has it always just remained with food it's really just remained with like food but actually i take that back 
I mean, exercise is also really easy to control. Yeah, I, I, that's why I was asking because I remember you writing a little about, um, you know, you were following some of our training plans yeah. and, and you were really into it. And then it seemed like maybe you caught yourself maybe taking it too seriously and being, you know, you felt like you needed to step back and have fun again. Absolutely. And I think that it's funny, like every time I try like training for something, this happens. And I told myself this is like this last time that I tried and it's nothing to do with your plan, I swear. No, 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 no. I I think it's just a, you know, I think it's something that if we were to come up with a plan just for you, we would try and work that in yeah but i can see especially if you're using one of the ebooks that it, it could be really easy to take that addiction and apply it definitely and that's like with any training plan i feel like that's what's happened to me in the past right. and i realized with the last time around i was like you know what i'm not going to train for anything like this until i know that i'm in like the best possible place I can be with my head. Right. And until right. I feel that, <clears throat> I'm just going to go out and have fun. And like, that's what climbing should be about in the first place anyways. Yeah. And by um, having fun, you're progressing. Oh, absolutely. I'm like growing mentally. I'm like getting physically stronger. It's been like really inspiring just to like go out and have fun and also like see results that you didn't even really like expect to or necessarily like seek out. Um, but I've also like changed a lot of my goals too, which has been cool. And I don't have any like super concrete goals right now, but I started trad climbing last year. Yeah. And so that's kind of like when everything switched over because I got, I didn't get obsessed with it, but I definitely, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely like fell in love with it. So yeah, so that's what I've been pretty stoked on now. I'm becoming like a more competent trad climber and eventually would like to do like bigger things out West. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So as a coach and the people listening as parents, as friends, as coaches, a couple of things. A, how do we recognize that there's something going on? And then B, what's our role there? What can we do about it? Yeah, I feel like it's it can be a little tricky Um, because not all eating disorders look the same. Right, sure. And especially with, like, adults, it's easy to notice that, like, maybe they're just going on a diet for something and not exactly equating it with being an eating disorder. Yep. So it's something that you have to, like, kind of, like, tread carefully with. But I think the biggest thing is, like, educating both, like, as a coach yourself, Mm -hmm. the parents, and also having, like, some court of some sort of communication with like the athlete or the kid like having some sort of like you know presentation whatever it may be just so they can be more aware of like potential consequences that would come with like dieting or like that could become an eating disorder over time so that's like the only tricky part is there's a lot of things that look like eating disorders but they're not and so it's something that you just really like need to educate yourself on and advanced and it's something that I'm actually looking into I would love this to be implemented into USA climbing having like all the coaches have to go through some sort of education and awareness so we can like stop this problem in its tracks while we can right um but it is tricky like I'm sure you may have seen it in your like the people that you coach Uh but I have um, a a couple of times Uh, I've been positive that that's what's going on and it's it's tricky to approach that person because oftentimes it's going to be there's going to be denial you know they don't know they're doing it necessarily like like you said before this is just something i can control i'm you know i'm giving myself the reasons why i'm doing it and it makes perfect sense but so when i go to these people and say hey i think there's something going on that we should maybe look a little closer at they're like nothing's going on what do you mean exactly you know? so that's that's where it becomes really tricky because when you do approach someone that potentially has an eating disorder they're going to deny it pretty much every time yeah yeah and why i mean why would why would someone confess to something about that when it's like it's their comfort you know if something's super comforting to you it's really hard to like let that go and yeah um so i guess that's 
it's like I said, it's really tricky. But I think that, again, education and awareness are like super, super important um, going forward. And as the like climbing community grows, as the climbing is in the Olympics, the problem will only continue to get bigger. Sure. Unless we really yeah. start implementing like education and like awareness stuff now. Is um, there you know, are there any resources you know of off the top of your head that people can look at or so, go to? Um, the National Eating Disorders Association, um, just their website has so many great resources. They have like a list of treatment facilities in every state. Um, they have a hotline that you can call. Um, they have just a bunch of resources for parents and people that think that someone that they love has an eating disorder and how to like approach that. Great. I like really send everyone to that website if they think someone has an eating disorder. Right. Um, but just like also seeking out like potential um, like eating disorder treatment facilities in your area and talking to people that work there to kind of see how you can move forward um, because it's tricky when you're really close with someone and they're going through something like that and trying to intervene because you don't want to lose your friend right exactly but you also don't want to lose your friend yeah um, and you and it's it you know i'm not even sure where my role is in that that's the tough part like is it my place am i you know if it's my significant other or my best friend then i understand that that I have a, a place, I have a right to speak up. But if it's just someone I know sort of on the periphery, I don't know if it's my place or not. So, so I do think having a resource like that to go to and, you know, a hotline to call or someone to get advice from who understands the situation is a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Cause it is hard. Like you don't want to, you don't want to feel like you're intervening in someone's life and getting in their personal business. Right. But at the same time, if you're like friends with someone or like you're, you know, someone, you don't want to see them go through something so like challenging and something that can be so like detrimental, like for them for the rest of their life. So, um, really it's just, it comes down to the decision you want to make, like how much you care about the friendship, but also recognizing that like once they do decide to like get better, that, friendship can rekindle and rekindle in a different way that is a lot closer and I've like noticed that with friends that I'm close with now is that sure I've intervened and like they've had to go to treatment but at the same time they recognize that I like saved their life in the long run right so it's just like it's your choice honestly and it depends also on how like on how far along someone is on like in their <clears throat> path to, like destructive ways with their eating disorder yeah. So since most of the people who listen to this are climbers, mm -hmm. how has the climbing community reacted to to you being so open about this? And um, I mean, A, have you seen any pushback? Have there been people who are like, oh, no, this isn't a real thing? Um, I haven't really seen any pushback because I feel like, I don't know, it seems like people wouldn't. Or they're not, I don't know if they're afraid or I don't know if there's like people that are like that opinionated in that way. Right. Um, for, if anything, I've only received just like the utmost, like greatest support that I've Good. ever had Good. from climbers. Um, they all, a lot of people recognize it's a problem, but it's not something that people are willing to speak out about. Right. But it's something that like, if we begin to have this conversation, it'll only get easier to talk about and it becomes a lot less like of a problem especially like as big as it is now so um i th i don't think i've really received any like negative commentary um that's really good I'm yeah glad. because the internet can be a pretty rough place oh, sometimes gosh. you know yeah. and it makes it extra scary to put yourself out there in in the kind of you know exposing way that you are um, yeah, hitting the submit button the first time I like put my blog post out there was like the most nerve wracking time of my life. Yeah, and then like it only got better from there. Yep. Um. So you continue <laughs> to have this discussion. Like, usually when I talk about like my past with my eating disorder, I'll just get like super emotional. And now it's just like such an easy conversation to have because I like actually like talking about it because it's something I care so deeply about, and I've talked about it so much that's it's a lot easier to yeah, talk. Yeah, and it's gonna help people. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think, and I, I hope it does. That's like, not only is it helping myself, but I also hope it like helps other people in the long run. Sure, sure. And I know you mentioned earlier that 
you and our mutual friend Angie Payne had a conversation recently, and Angie just uh, collaborated on an article and uh, that that I think was pretty revealing. I've known Angie for a long time, and she's not necessarily always been that open Mm -hmm. with her you know her personal life and and I think it was pretty important that she put that out there did you reach out to Angie after reading that article immediately after I reached out to Angie and Emily just like thanking them um for being so vulnerable and like beginning this conversation especially because they do have such like a presence in the climbing community and the climbing industry that it was super powerful for them to like speak speak about their past um regardless of how detailed they went um it was very inspiring for me to read and I know many others felt the same way and so I had reached out to Angie and then um, we we kind of went from there and hoping to like collaborate with her in the future on like trying to solve this really big issue that we're dealing with right now. Yeah, I think that's a good connection because she's a she's a strong, positive force, um, and I think that's you know you're you're definitely still feeling your way and it's and it's growing and I can I can see it growing like even in just in this conversation. And since you've gotten here tonight, I've watched it grow, you know, and I'm really excited about that. So I'm I'm really happy that you're reaching out to people who are also starting to become willing to speak up. And, and I believe that part of that, you know, this wave of people starting to speak up is in no small part because of you speaking up to begin with. You know, someone has to start the conversation. Someone has to keep the conversation going. And you fit in there somewhere for sure. Yeah, it's it's been really powerful to see that, like, just from the last post that I was grateful to get Michaela to, like, contribute yep. on, yep. how, like, my blog just kind of, like, blew up. And it really, really did get – I got so much positive feedback. And a lot of people didn't recognize how how big of a problem it is, especially, like – amongst like youth climbers that are coming up and have all this pressure like put on them right um to like send harder things and uh it was it was really great to have that kind of like leverage so i could get the word out there and really get it spread like across not just like my personal community but like across you know the nation if not the world just like looking at my statistics i was completely like amazed with you know 40,000 views we just right. need to like continue to have this conversation and um, what's even more remarkable is 40,000 views without any negative feedback i, I don't think. get it <laughs> <laughs> how did it even make it on the internet <laughs> yeah, that, that never happens so no kidding so you're doing something right and i'm i'm really happy for that and thanks for being willing to sit down and talk about it and you know as this goes i'd love to sit down again and see where you're at with it and and see you know what you think in the future is going to be the way forward for helping other young girls young climbers you know figure this thing out for themselves yeah absolutely thank you i really appreciate you having me on (laughs) yeah no problem savannah cool Can I ask you one more question on the record? Yeah, go for it. (laughs) What are the best donuts in Chicago? Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, So the Donut Vault is definitely my favorite. So they have like a tiny store in the loop and they sell out every day. So you have to get there early. The Donut Bowl. The Donut Vault. Oh, Vault. The the Donut Vault. That makes it sound even cooler. Oh yeah, it's the best. And then you can go to like, they have a truck like a really old-fashioned truck that if you follow their social media feed they'll post where they're gonna be that day and yeah the donuts there are like definitely like the best but if i had to choose a second favorite it's definitely stan's donuts stan's stan's donuts. yeah i already like stan's donuts better just because stan sounds cool yeah it sounds pretty cool right what's your favorite like your single favorite donut blueberry old-fashioned or anything old-fashioned i really like (laughs) (laughs) this is something you're passionate about i can tell clearly we should have just had a whole podcast about donuts donuts? yeah i like old-fashioned donuts like (laughs) chocolate orange orange chocolate blueberry pistachio like anything i'm all about it (laughs) awesome awesome i'm going 
straight to Donut Vault and to Stan's Donuts next time I'm in Chicago. Perfect, so. perfect. Make sure to hit me up. I'll come with you. I will. I'll buy you a donut. <laughs> there you go. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I kind of feel like I need a donut right now. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that's my next stop. In all seriousness, thanks, Savannah, for sitting down with me and having this conversation and being so open and so honest. You know, I, I think this is a really great way to learn, and it's better than waiting until you're confronted with the situation um, and you're just going to bumble through it. I would much rather spend some time with someone like Savannah talking it over and trying to understand it um, so that I can be better prepared as a coach and as a friend and as a a partner or a mentor or whatever the situation might be I think it's important for us so so thanks again for sitting down with me and if you're if you guys want to check out Savannah's blog it's crimpin and biscuits at savannahbuick.com that's s-a-v-a-n-n-a-h-b-u-i-k.com and you guys should check that out and spread the word And uh, special thanks to all the folks out in Missouri. We are finishing up the tour today, and then we are headed to Boise. If you're in Boise or around Idaho, we'll be at Asana Climbing Gym the 25th through the 27th from 6 to 9 p.m. Come out and see us. If you have not yet, which many of you have, and I appreciate that, if you have not checked out our new Applied Body Tension ebook, it is on the website now, powercompanyclimbing.com along with our process journals. Uh, Those two make a great pairing. So please go check those out. Help support the podcast. You can also do that at patreon.com slash powercompanypodcast, and you can offer some support there. We appreciate that hugely. You guys have turned out in droves. Not quite the droves that the Eclipse is getting today, but droves nonetheless. So thank you a ton. And we will see you on the interwebs in the interim. We'll see you at powercompanyclimbing.com. We'll see you at the Facebooks. We'll see you on the Instagrams. I won't see you at Pinterest, even if you're at Pinterest, but still visit us there. I will not ever see you on the Twitters because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, 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 this This time to finish, 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 this time to fin